What is burnout? It's the triad of exhaustion, cynicism, and ineffectiveness. When I went on medical leave for burnout, I started researching and I found that stress causes or exacerbates more than 80% of all illness. I think in healthcare, giving people a physical prescription and telling them to take three pills twice a day and see you in two weeks is a big miss on the healing. Neha Sangwan, MD, is an internal medicine physician, international speaker, best-selling author, and a communications expert. She addresses the root cause of stress, miscommunication, and interpersonal conflict, often healing chronic conditions such as headaches, insomnia, anxiety, depression, and burnout. And through her books and private practice is making a huge impact on creating a healthier, happier society. I'm so grateful to have you here. We've already been having a good time and we're gonna talk about an issue that is really gripping our society and it's not getting a lot of attention. It is very real. It's impacted both of us. Mm -hmm. It's probably impacted just about everybody listening. And it is this topic, it has the label that we give it called burnout, but there's some deep biological and psychological aspects of this that we're gonna to unpack today. And so I'd love to start off by talking about what is burnout? Yeah, I, I think one of the most important things we can do is demystify burnout, personalize it to each listener and everyone watching, and then give them powerful practical tools to heal. So let's do it. Uh, what is burnout? I'm gonna give you a more scientific explanation to start. And then I'm going to tell you where I disagree with what that is. Okay. Awesome. And that's just through my lived experience of going through burnout myself and being a physician and treating tens of thousands of people with this. So burnout, if you read about it, it's actually a triad. So it's the triad of exhaustion, physical, mental, emotional exhaustion. And that's usually going on over a period of time. It's not like you wake up Monday and you're fine. And then by Friday, you're exhausted and burned out. That's not how it works because our bodies are so sophisticated. Our blood pressure changes, our heart rate changes. We start adjusting physiologically well before we get burned out. On top of that, we use strategies numbing strategies, coping mechanisms, all sorts of ways to prop ourselves up, whether it's, you know, an energy drink, it's, you know, a soda, it's sugar, it's drugs, it's alcohol, I, whatever your flavor of it is. It's make mine a double today when you talk to the barista. I don't know what your flavor of it is, but we've also got these external ways that we prop ourselves up. So that physical, mental, emotional exhaustion, which is the first part of the triad, occurs over time. Mm -hmm. Another piece, the second part of the triad is cynicism. So cynicism comes in where, okay, now you're, you're exhausted, but you're still driving towards whatever it is you want. But then this undertow, almost like you're walking on the beach and you can feel an undertow, but you might not be able to see it. There's this thought process that comes in that says something to us like, it doesn't matter how hard I try, it's not gonna make a difference anyway. And our own thoughts start to undermine that exhaustion that's already going on. Mm. Now you're in trouble mm. because the third element is ineffectiveness. So you literally cannot do the, the thing that you were once really good at doing or able to do pretty effortlessly. It starts to become hard and you are no longer effective. So exhaustion, cynicism, and ineffectiveness. I want to give you one more piece on the cynicism angle. What starts happening after people have been exhausted for a while is they naturally go into a way of conservation. So even though they might feel isolated from other people, they might seek connection. They actually do this thing called depersonalization, mm -hmm. where they don't have the energy to socially connect. So they'll distance themselves or they'll, let's say I'm a doctor and I'm in the hospital. I'll say things like this, patient in bed nine. I won't use their name. I, I just don't have the energy to connect that much. It doesn't mean I'm not a caring doctor or nurse. It means, or a teacher or a, anyone, right? It just means that there's this part where I just need to distance myself from the emotional aspect because I don't have it in me. Holy moly. Mm. This is, 
I mean, you're just describing things that I've experienced and so many people have. And even this aspect of depersonalization, it's not that we mean to, like you just said, you know, we could be a really great person and have great intentions, but just because our bandwidth has just been, we don't even have the band anymore in the, in the bandwidth. And yeah, this is scary, you know, because what are some of the outcomes that happen when we experience burnout? Like this is the part where we need to start to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Shout out to Ice Cube, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, I'm just going to confess something here that if doctors or nurses are listening, they're going to be like, I can't believe she said that out loud. But it's really on reflection that I realized one of the ways that I did this. So I'm a busy hospital doctor. I have 18 hospitalized patients that can crash at any time. The hospital wants me to make sure I discharge by 11 a.m. Kind of like a hotel, right? Get out your checkout at 11 a.m., which is smart because they want to know how many beds are available for new people coming in. I did not realize this until I had burned out. The psychiatrist I was speaking to said to me, did you find yourself adjusting in any way in the past couple months? And it really hit me. There was this moment where I was like, oh, I knew that if I worked really hard to discharge four patients instead of three, what it meant was at 6 p.m., I get the gift of a brand new patient, brand new family, brand new. So I started adjusting. You know, when I told you that depersonalization mm -hmm. started happening, I was not lazy at all. In fact, what I would say is I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm a, you know, internal medicine physician. I work really hard. And that's a mistake people make about burnout. They think that people are like trying to get away with something. People who burn out are usually your highest performers. They're working them. They're working straight through their own physiology to get the job done. But really in that moment, I started pulling back and saying, if I could come up with a reason why the next day was okay, I would say, you know what? Let me take care of these three discharges. Let me tell the fourth one to get ready because it'll be tomorrow. And that's kind of how I saved myself for another eight months. <laughs> now, in my previous world, I would have called myself a slacker. I would have, I would have been really hard on myself. Now I understand after researching this for 20 years. Oh, no. Thank you, Neha. Thank you for being so smart physiologically to figure out how to maintain your energy so you didn't burn out. Right? So sometimes the external world is going to place demands on us yeah. that don't allow us to think for ourselves or figure it out. Sometimes we're going to speak up and say, that doesn't work. I'm exhausted, but we aren't going to be heard. And what I want you to know is it's as important when you're interviewing to for a job, for a position, for working with a company, for being in partnership. Don't look at it as they're interviewing you. Look at it as a two way interview. Is this a place I would thrive? If I speak up and say something, do they hear me? Mm -hmm. Because I believe how fast the, our world is moving is going to require a new level of iteration and partnership like we have never seen before. Absolutely. And you just said it. we unconsciously make these adjustments to mm -hmm. try to just keep going, especially if we care. You bet. You know, ironically. You bet. And you mentioned also the coping mechanisms that we turn to. And again, a lot of this stuff just starts piling on and we don't realize it because we're just doing what we've got to do. The, the story we've told ourselves and what we got to do. And it can be as simple as even working out. Some people will say, I went for a run. I, I could always manage my stress, go for a two mile run, three mile run, whatever it is. And I could manage my stress. The moment you notice you need five miles to get the same effect you got with two or three, pay attention. Pay attention because your physiology just shifted. You coped with it in a way that gives you an awesome physique, feels good, releases endorphins. But if you're not paying attention, you're not realizing that the temperature is getting higher and higher. Mm. So whatever your coping mechanism, 
notice if you need more of it to get the same effect. It's like cooking a lobster. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. So this is really important because when we, I know for myself, when I hear the word burnout, I would psychologically tie that to work, right? Mm. For, for, for our society. But you have really enlightened us in so many ways on how it is not just about work. It is our overall lifescape, right? It's all yeah. the different aspects of our lives because it could be relationship related. Oh, you know, 100%. pouring into that burnout equation. It could be um, spiritual, you know, just feeling yeah. a lack of purpose and connection. And, you know, you really unpack all these different areas. And that's, I love that so much because it's real that there's not one part of us, you know, mm -hmm. we're dynamic. We have so many aspects that make us who we are, yeah. you know, and you address each of these, the physical compartment, the emotional compartment. And if you could, let's talk a little bit more about that, our sure. overall kind of burnout equation. All right, let's back up here. So the World Health Organization, when I burned out in 2004, and literally, literally, Sean, I walked in, 18 hospitalized patients, fifth day on service. They asked me to take the alpha pager, which means you take all air traffic control of transfers coming in from all local hospitals. So you can imagine the level of busy, right? I need to sign off all my patients. I'm doing all of this. 11 a.m., I walked up to the nurse and I said, hey, Nina, could you please get 40 mil equivalents of IV potassium for the gentleman in 636? And she looked at me and she said, Dr. Sangwan, are you okay? And that was my first indication that I might not be. And I said, yeah, why? And she said, because that is the fourth time in under five minutes that you've asked me that same question and I've answered you every time. I had no awareness of this. And that's what I mean when I said, you know how we just did the triad of exhaustion, cynicism and ineffectiveness? That was the moment I hit a wall without knowing it. And I have to tell you, we have to pay attention to each other now. I'm swimming in the, the temperature going up and up degree by degree, and I'm not noticing that something's happening. If that nurse didn't say that to me, I could have written the wrong prescription, the wrong dosage. I could have done something much bigger than I did. And so one thing I'll say is I think we're going back to the old days where it's the return of community. We need each other. We're moving too fast. Now, when I burned out in 2004, in 2003, the World Health Organization had decided that burnout wasn't a diagnosis. Um, it was like a collection of some, you know, symptoms that might contribute to this. Fast forward, 2019 is the first time that they have agreed that it is a collection of symptoms called a syndrome, and it is due to unmanaged stress at work. Now, this is where I disagree. Uh, my patients have had a special needs child at home, have been going through a difficult relationship at home. Exactly the things you were saying. I don't care where stress comes from. If it is chronic and unmanaged for you, yeah. it can lead to burnout. So it could be any one of us. Yeah. And I would imagine it's going to spill over into those other things. Of It has to. We yeah. like to say things in our society like keep work at work and home at home. I think that's just because we don't know how to handle conflict. And so what we do is we try to make it all nice and clean, which is leave your emotions at home, leave home at home and work, work at work. Except how do you get into a subway, get in a car and get out of it? Uh, however you commute in the days when we commuted all the time, how could commuting change who you are at home or at work just because you get in some sort of transportation? So and now I think what what the pandemic did was it made work home. And it stripped us of those barriers. And so now all of a sudden, who can say that? We see your dog running around. We see the kids playing like home is work. And so now we're starting to learn that maybe we're running away from conflict uh, and things that drain us. And maybe if we learn to lean into those, we would up level what I call our human software so that we can function. All of us can function in the world we've co-created.
because we've used our minds to co-create a world that's going faster and faster. I mean, here's generative AI, right? And now we're moving even faster and faster, except what I don't think we took into account when we thought we as a society say faster is better, do more with less. What we did not take into account was our own biology. Our biology needs exertion and rest. There's a rhythm that goes on in nature seasonally and within us. And we did not respect that. What we have decided is faster is better. And the people who are successful in our world amass the most amount of wealth, name, power, whatever it is. And so we have something socially going on that actually doesn't match with our individual biology. Yeah. So. <sighs> Being that this is, you mentioned the S word. You said stress, yeah. right? It, it can be a, and this is a thing too, of course, we don't want to villainize stress. Stress is a part of life. It helps us to grow and to adapt. There's hormetic stressors Change. that, you know, that yeah. help us to get stronger. You bet. But when it becomes chronic yeah, and being that stress is the undercurrent for burnout, yeah, this can obviously, and this is a big part of the reason why I'm excited to have you here, which there's many reasons is that folks can be dealing with stuff, especially in our culture, as you just described, powering through, doing what we've got to do, getting stuff done, you know, taking care of people yep. and experiencing health issues, a myriad mm -hmm. of health issues. Mm -hmm. You know, this could be an autoimmune condition. This could be some cognitive dysfunction. Mm -hmm. This could be sexual dysfunction. Yep. And to enlighten folks on the fact that this could be due to burnout. So yeah. if you could, let's talk a little bit about some of the outer expressions that we might see mm -hmm. that might give us a little bit of an indication, like maybe we need to look inward. Yeah. So how this might show up. So I we talked about the triad of burnout. So exhaustion, cynicism, ineffectiveness. That happens over time in three phases. So the first phase is the alarm phase. The alarm phase is almost like you jumped on a treadmill going too fast, just slightly too fast. That moment where you're you're a little bit jarred, your adrenaline kicks in and, and you're getting your bearings. So that's the alarm phase of burnout. And during that phase, you might feel pretty obvious, like heart racing, um, your gut, your stomach might be turning. We have lots of nerves, right? In our, yes, in our brain and our spinal cord, yes, in our heart, but really also in our gut. And so GI symptoms, diarrhea, constipation, stomach turning, just feeling really unsettled, headaches, uh, insomnia, all sorts of issues. Now, the first thing I wanna say is, anytime you have any of those symptoms, please don't go straight to burnout. And this is the doctor kicking in in me. Yeah. Please go get a clean bill of health because it could be signaling something else. But once you go to your physician, your practitioner, and they say, oh, no, we've run all the tests. There's nothing physically wrong with you. And then they say you're fine, but you know you're not fine. That's when I want you to think, oh, what if this is unmanaged stress? What if this is burnout? But that's always the second line. Um, so there's some physical symptoms. Then there's also emotions that you might notice like irritability. You're snapping at people and you, you don't recognize yourself. You're coming in late. You're starting to, you're missing deadlines when that's never you. This is going to sound silly, but people say to me, oh, you wrote a book on communication. So I'm sure all your relationships, none of them have conflict. And I'm sure that you're never burned out. Okay. Launching a burnout book nearly burned me out. Okay. <laughs> um, and so yeah. I say, no, 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 no. What I want you to know is all I've done is compiled what I've learned in a way that I hope my pain and growth and life school could be someone else's survival guide. But what I, what's changed for me is that when I fall off the horse, I get on much quicker and I recognize things much quicker. Yeah. So as I was launching the book, this is going to sound silly, but it's like I missed a Manny Petty appointment that I had prepaid for. Mm -hmm. And they called saying like, sorry, you know, we, we don't see you here. Are you coming? I didn't even I, I didn't mm -hmm. even check my phone. Nothing. So two hours later, I realized I just lost more than one hundred dollars because I missed an appointment and I thought to myself, Neha, slow 
down. Mm. And it was one of those early alarm phases. So what I'd say to you is it sounds simple and maybe minor, but I knew it was the alarm phase of burnout for me on the book tour. Yeah. And so I got back on, I stopped, I slowed down, I canceled everything that was non-urgent and I slowed myself down. So it's, it's not that when you do this, you're done or that you know, someone who writes a book on burnout doesn't burn out. It's that when you know these signals and signs, you pick things up earlier and you don't get all the way to the end where I'm ineffective as a doctor in the hospital. So that would be the alarm phase. You know, you'll, you'll start noticing you're coming in late, you're missing deadlines, all of that. Then if that continues and the alarm phase becomes your way of living, now you've put in all those coping mechanisms we talked about. You're having two cups of coffee in the morning, a glass of wine after work to take the edge off. You're doing all the things you're doing, your physiology. Now you're moving into chronic adaptation phase where you're just hanging on by a thread. Your physiology is trying to help you. But now you're starting to notice things like the weekend isn't enough to recover. It's Monday and you still feel heavy. Right. So there's there's going to be these ways where you start to uh, call in sick, procrastinate, do what I did where I didn't discharge the fourth patient. Right. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm literally trying to hold on in chronic adaptation. And then one more thing happens and it might be a small thing. You know, so-and-so can't make it to your birthday party. Oh, the whole thing. You go sliding down the slippery slope mm -hmm. of exhaustion phase to ineffectiveness. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, what's wrong with you? You're, you're overreacting. It's just someone couldn't make it. And it's huge to you because you have no capacity left. So alarm phase, chronic adaptation phase, exhaustion phase. Now, how do I know somebody is getting to the end of the chronic adaptation phase? apathy. They start not caring. They're using more and more of that coping mechanism that we talked about, and they didn't even realize it. Um, and so then when you, you slide down the slippery slope of burnout, that's when a week off doesn't help you. That's when you're feeling you, you might cross with depression. Depression and burnout are not the same thing. There's a big debate, you know, going on in the scientific community about that. But the best way I could say it to you is burnout is like a fire energy. It's like there's something that you're going to create. I want to I single handedly thought I could change healthcare. You know, I mean, I've got the best intentions. Yeah. And there's something that starts to happen that unravels that experience. And you start to realize you're carrying a boulder uphill and it's not going to work. Depression can come from in an instant. It can come from an old wound being triggered. It can come in, in a very different way. And it's more of a stuck energy, a heavy stuck energy, more than it's a on fire driving energy. That's how I think of it. So when, when my clients are coming in and they're asking me like, doc, do you think I'm depressed? Do you think I burned out? I'm paying attention to the context of what's happening right? The onset, the, you know, what, what is this? Is there, is there some sort of, that was a really simple way to try and describe it, but those two things can overlap, but they're not always the same thing. Hmm. Yeah. I love this. You know, at the end there, you mentioned how you were single-handedly going to change healthcare, <laughs> you know, and the thing is that aspiration to, to dream and to see so big is necessary. Yeah. But, you know, I've said this before, you know, I, I had that same kind of pull to change the world and mm -hmm. it almost killed me, you know, like <laughs> you're trying to do this thing that is seemingly impossible, but here's a cool thing. You have made, you've made your mark mm -hmm. in, a, in a major way. I mean, mm -hmm. the trickle down effects of your work already and the same thing I've seen in my life. And sometimes we don't acknowledge that change because we're looking at this, this massive thing. And what happens is, and what really helped me was realizing, and you said this earlier, we need each other, oh. right? Cause you said single handedly, yep. you know, that's just, that's single hand is one hand, but you just got two of them, you know? <laughs> We're not like, you know what I mean? We're not yeah. octopuses out here. And yeah. being able to, to work with other people, to be able to collaborate, you know, and the power, like there's this 
there's this amplification that happens when you are united with others to accomplish things. That is unable to happen alone. Yeah. Like there's there's just this magic, this synergy. Yeah. And I think we have to come back to that because I think there's there's a way where we've really gone solo. We've become lone rangers and it's been cool yeah. and to be independent and all of this, which it is. It's wonderful. When we're too dependent, like it's almost like too much or too little of anything is the problem. Mm. Sounds so, like some Goldilocks stuff. Yeah, a little Goldilocks stuff because it's like, yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm an independent woman and I also realized that I was lonely. And so when I started dating my partner, you know, I could carry my own bags. I could pay for everything myself. I was financially independent. I was in my career. And what I learned was that's his the way he loves me. Mm. He wants me to allow him to do that. But my father growing up said, no daughter of mine's going to be dependent on a man. You are going to be independent financially and otherwise. And then I used to say, dad, am I packing too much? And he said, honey, no problem. I got three girls and your mother. You pack it, you carry it. And so from a very young age, I learned that. And I realized that too much of that started to create the stress of loneliness for me. And when Raj and I got together, one of the things I said, oh, I can carry it. And he said, I know you can carry it. I'd like to carry it for you. Are you open to that? Mm. And I was like, oh, wow. I didn't realize that I was creating my own isolation. Oh, man. Where do we do that in our lives in mm. other ways, you know? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we've broken this down. We've got the alarm phase, the chronic adaptation phase, the apathy phase. And well, apathy is right at the end of chronic adaptation that sends you right into exhaustion. Phase. Exhaustion. But the so apathy that's the, that's the is bridge. the key. That's the that's how I know you're going to tip into the last that's one. That's the rickety bridge. It is. Because when right. you start not caring, you're you're going down. Yeah. All right. So we're looking to reclaim mm -hmm. our our energy. We're looking to rejuvenate. We're looking to be powered by us, yeah, yeah. Being, being powered by ourselves. And you've broken this down again. There's a masterpiece within these pages mm, because you're addressing you. all the different aspects that, you know, it's going to affect each of us differently. You know, yeah. I kind of felt when I started to, to even look at the table of contents of the book, like this might be like a little bit of a choose your own adventure. Yeah. You know, yeah. on what you need to focus on a little bit more, because for some of us, it, it is physical. It's going to be more of a causative agent. For some, it's more of a solution. Yep. For others, it can be something more emotional, emotional yep. exercises or emotional trigger yeah. that's causing it. Uh, the spiritual aspect, you look at that as well. And I want to talk about a little bit mm -hmm. of each of these categories because I want to talk about solutions, you know, yeah. for folks that are hearing some things that sound familiar. Yeah. And they're wanting to address this burnout. We don't want to make our uh, aspirations of getting rid of burnout burn us out. You yeah. Know? And so just being able to like, what are some science backed tools? But also, we talked about this before the show and how important it is for that end of one equation and really yeah. paying attention to work. What works for you? The data might say this, but something might work for you that isn't necessarily for other people. Yeah. And you got to trust that. What's really important is that for one person, it can change. So in my 30s, it was my career and uh, physical that, w that was draining. In my 40s, it was my emotional and spiritual crisis around meaning. And so the cool thing about Powered by Me is really what it is, is wherever you are on the spectrum from burned out to fully charged, can be determined by whether you have a net gain or a net drain of energy on a physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual level. And so we'll give, you know, the listeners uh, an assessment that they can take, which is intuitiveintelligenceinc.com forward slash burnout hyphen RX. And so you can do an assessment so that you can figure out wow, if this is choose my own adventure, what area am I area or areas am I having a net gain? And where am I having a net drain? Because someone who's burned out, truly burned out, doesn't need to be reading a 300 page book, right? What they need is the emergency toolkit on page 20, 
And I'm happy for you to link that as well. If someone directly doesn't need to buy the book, but wants that emergency toolkit, what I put in there was the first thing we have to do is ground you back in your physiology, because no matter what is draining you of stress, it's been going on for a while. And so I know in your uh, other episodes, you've spoken of things like vitamin C and magnesium and all the things, the biochemical reactions going on in your body under stress that deplete you. And so what this will give you, the emergency toolkit will give you a way to Use your imagination, your breath, because it's called guided imagery, right? That's one tool that I'm thinking of right now. Guided imagery is a way that you use your mind, just like athletes use their mind at halftime to imagine themselves holding the trophy and celebrating a victory at the Super Bowl, or a diver in the Olympics creates that perfect 10 visualization, we too can use that imagery to help ourselves heal before a surgery. Uh, there's studies that have been done showing that people who have guided imageries before they go into surgery need less pain medication on the way on the other end and heal faster. Now, you don't need to be going in for, to surgery for this. You need to be living in our everyday world to be benefiting from this. Now, how do we know this works? I want you to just take a really simple example, a nightmare. Mm -hmm. So you're lying in bed, someone's chasing you, you're falling off a cliff, they're breaking in. I don't know what they're doing, but your mind, your body doesn't know the difference between thoughts that are real or imagined. So when someone's breaking in in your dream or chasing you or whatever it is, all of a sudden you wake up, your heart's pounding, you're sweating, you're throwing the covers off. You look around and it's pitch black and silent because your body doesn't know the difference between what's real or imagined. So if that's what happens in a nightmare, why wouldn't we flip that and use that capability to take us to our favorite place? Maybe it's a safe place, a place you feel safe and comfortable. And so there's Experiences like that, if somebody knows when they're listening right now, oh my God, I am totally burned out, and you don't feel like you've got the bandwidth to do much more than listen to this podcast, right? Go there and just get some exercises that will help your physiology reset itself. You also talk about breath work. You know, I've I've listened to uh, you know, breath work is great too. There will take you through exercises um more than that. There is, uh, so let's just start. Let's start physical, okay? Mm -hmm. So on a physical level, I speak about the way you nourish yourself and the frequency with it, you know, during the day, you gotta find what's right for you and that you're eating whole foods rather than what my friend Mark Hyman calls Franken foods, food that is in a box or is packaged and is not really wholesome food for you. Then there's sleep. Are you getting seven to nine hours of quality sleep a night? Um, I, of course, you know, it's so amazing. Yes. I wear, wear my, uh, aura ring. Um, but I get really upset with myself when I wake up in the morning and I don't check in with my body. I look at my readiness score. <laughs> like, yeah. am I done yet? Am I ready? I don't even check in with my own body anymore. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's one of the, you know, it's, um, paradox, you know, it is. and, Part of the reason that we're in the situation that we're in is we're not checking in and paying mm -hmm. attention to that internal data. And it's our body is, and I, this was, oh, a big part of, you know, when I was researching you that it kept jumping out was like you directing us to pay attention because our body is very, very good at telling you stuff oh. if we're listening. And so yeah. we get dependent on these external things to tell us how we feel. Yeah. Ironically, right? And it's cool that we have this stuff. Yeah. But we need to cultivate our own internal intelligence because it is it's far more, far more powerful than any of this stuff. You know, if I if if we think back to our ancestors, the rustling of leaves would be the difference between life and death for them. Mm -hmm. That's how tuned in they were. 
right? Like paying attention to their surroundings, paying attention to their gut. We notice animals, whether it's a tsunami, a fire, they, they know, they, they sense even, you know, do you ever notice how animals just come and snuggle up next to a person who has like peaceful, harmonious energy? Animals know, you know, yeah. so there's this instinctive inner world and I, I call it, it's chapter four in the book and I, it's really about deciphering our body's unique language. So for me, um, I was excited to come and, you know, meet you and, and be on the podcast today. And I noticed, and I said, you know, to my partner, oh, like I feel a little bit of contraction, like in my throat and a little bit of turning in my stomach. Now that's my body's way of saying I'm excited. Sometimes it's my body's contracted way of saying you're not speaking your truth, but I've learned to decipher in what situations my body's trying to communicate with me. But for you, it might be something totally different. And for the listeners, it might be their heart racing or sweating. Do you know what it is for you when you get a little out of your comfort zone? Hmm. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, maybe like yeah. when you're out, go on vacation and it's a little oh, out of your comfort okay. zone. All right. So I, <laughs> I tend to have the bigger things happen, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not really a person who experiences a lot of like, if I'm, you know, doing something, you know, going on TV, for example, mm -hmm. I don't really get nervous around those kind of things yep. or, you know, experiencing anxiety or anything like that. Yeah. And I know what those things feel like, you know, yeah. back in the day, I would experience some of those things. But I'm very comfortable. I'm just very comfortable doing the things that I'm set out to do. Yep. But maybe I'm not because mm. maybe I compartmentalize and I mm. carry things and it might show up, for example, this is the second year in a row where I take a vacation time and my entire vacation, I'm experiencing neck pain, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Second year in a row, no neck pain through the year, <laughs> any other time, but you know, and it was, it was a result, the neck pain was a result of a knot showing up in my muscles, like in my, in my shoulder mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, you know, causing some restriction on one side. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I work, I, I've picked up skill set from last time this happened and I work on that, work that knot out and I can move my head with more range of motion. The next day, the knot's on the other side, like, yeah. hey, tapping me on the shoulder, like, hey, and, you know, I, I'm going to pass this over to you, but one of my kind of superficial, you know, because... It's not really superficial. It's, it, this is an internal uh, investigation as well. But um, being able to get an outside perspective, I'm grateful for that. But it's just really, you know, carrying the weight on my shoulders, you know, mm. and being so, you know, dedicated to changing things. And I have this thing, and I'm about to say it out loud. I don't know if I've ever said this before out loud, but just I want my, I want my life to matter. I want to make mm. sure that when I leave here, things are better than when I got here. Mm. And I've already seen some incredible things, but also there are growing other issues at the same time. And, you know, so I do carry this weight on my shoulders and also, you know, my family, my kids and, um, you know, wanting to be a good example and all the things. And so maybe it's when I have my quote time off, my body is like, you got time to feel this now. You've yeah. got time to feel this stress yeah. that you've been carrying, yeah. that you've been able to maybe cope with yeah. and show up and kill it and do all the things that you set out to do. But you know what? You've got some things you didn't process. Mm. And so now I'm going to have your head straight <laughs> ahead. So is this, I'm, I don't um, know if this yeah. is sounding, you know. Yeah. Oh, this is, this is amazing. Okay. I'm going to take a little left turn here and we're going to give everybody a tool that's listening. So when I went on burnout, medical leave for burnout, I started researching and I found that 80 more, more than basically stress causes or exacerbates more than 80% of all illness. So stress is not a bad thing. Like we said, you can have you stress. You can have for me deadlines, get me moving. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about unmanaged chronic stress or the, the things that we avoid in order to keep this dream going right? That we may not have fully resolved to keep this going. So when I figured that out, I started asking my patients, well, all right, first I came back and asked all my colleagues, hey guys, if stress causes or exacerbates more than, you know, 80% of all illness, rather than having someone having a heart attack 
and us heroically saving them, getting chocolates and cards and flowers from the family were amazing. And then three years later, they're back in bed nine with another heart attack. That felt like a revolving door to me. And that was the moment I realized I wasn't solving their problems. I was band-aiding them through a crisis. And if stress is at the root of this, why are we not asking them what's at the root of their stress once we physically stabilize them? I asked countless doctors, my colleagues, in all disciplines, and they gave me some version of this. Neha, we're already so busy. Why on earth? I mean, we wouldn't order a test that we didn't know what to do with the result. Why would you ask a question that you didn't know what to do with the answer? And I, I was infuriated. I was like, because the world is depending on us to figure this out. That's why we would do it. And so I decided to go off on my own. And this is what I started doing. Five questions. You can apply it to your health. And I'm going to ask you right now. Um, but you can apply it to much more than your health. Why you didn't get the job, the relationship, whatever it is. So just whatever's natural. And you've started to already sort through quite a few of these. But whatever comes to you in each of these questions, just let that be the right answer. So it's called the awareness prescription. Mm -hmm. So question number one, why this? Why a heart attack? Why not someone's liver or their left leg? Why did this part of your body start talking? And so for you, it is your shoulders, right? And it's not one side, it's both. And so I think you, you started on that one. So why this? <laughs> yeah, um, I think I, I started to allude to it, which is like just carrying so much weight on my shoulders, Yeah, you know, trying to, and crazy enough, we leaned into this a little bit earlier, but single-handedly, yeah. right? And I, over the, t I would not have gotten to this place had I not started to outsource, but I can see as I'm talking to you right now, why you're so good at this? Because <laughs> as I'm talking this out, I'm seeing where I've contracted mm. over the past year. Mm. And where I have not connected, where I've not worked with others, where I've not, you know, outsourced mm -hmm. and, um, you know, kind of deloaded. And yeah, I can see that. And this is hitting me like a ton of bricks because as I mentioned, it was literally one year ago mm -hmm. through the vacation. Mm -hmm. Then I was fine. Same thing this last time. I started back to work yesterday mm -hmm. and it was as if nothing had ever happened, you wow. know, and it, it progressively got better. But it was still like 20% more to go, then boom, it was gone when I started back to work, Amazing. right? And yeah, so that's that's definitely what it is. I've contracted, mm -hmm. I have um, really, um, and you asked me this before we got going, it initially started when my father passed away right before the first time this happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I definitely had some feelings still of, being a light, you know, being the one to uplift my family and to take care of things and being the one that people can count on mm -hmm. and not sharing that stress, even with the people close to me. Yeah. Whew. <sighs> Just feel it. Feel it. Feel your bottom on the chair. Feel your feet on the floor. So the night before I discharge people, these are the five questions I'd be asking them to help them get to the root of their stress. So question number one, why this? And we just explored why your neck and shoulders carrying the weight of the world and on multiple levels. So then question number two, why now? So that would be why on those two vacations specifically, why not three years earlier? Why not two weeks later? Why literally in those intervals has it been contained? Because in the day-to-day, -day, I was caught up in the day-to-day. -day. I didn't have time to feel what I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And I also have these practices that keep me going, right? Very similar, you had a conversation with Mark Hyman, you know, like we have these, these wellness practices mm -hmm. that can band-aid things, right? And, you know, actually having the time where my mind is free, where I've determined, okay, I'm not going to do the day-to-day -day thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to push the envelope and, you know, focus on service. I'm just going to, 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 to power down. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And then that's when the the onset of this symptom would come up. Yeah. So when you slow down and there's actually time for you, literally not a practice, not a schedule that you've got to get through, not a routine that you've put in place, but kind of the unstructured space of new, unknown, unfamiliar, right? Then your body gets a chance. It knows it's not in that thing and it gets to relax. And the moment it relaxes, it goes knock, knock, knock. Are you there? If you're not paying attention, it knocks a little louder. And then when you get it out of one side, it's like, oh no, I'm not done. (laughs) And it's going to keep going, right? That wasn't. So it's interesting when something's showing up, Something unresolved on a mental, emotional, social, and spiritual level will eventually show up in your body to get your attention, right? So not only did you have the grief of losing your father, you had the added responsibility of, I'm already moving at this pace. I better step it up, right? And so you'll meet that challenge. You've trained your physical body, your mental and emotional self to do the thing because the higher purpose becomes my life better matter. And in the process, the question becomes, are you allowing all of you to integrate on that journey? So question number three, since hindsight's 2020, what clues, signals, patterns are perfectly clear now that maybe you didn't pick up right? Along the way. But now you can see, you can see them. Anything? Uh, Communication, Mm. you know, being able to share in real time, you know, how I'm feeling if something, you know, is weighing on me, Mm -hmm. you know, literally, you know, especially with my best friend, my wife, uh, my friends, my friend group, you know, I've been very much, and they know it, you know, I've been MIA, you know, the past mm. year, you know, so much less, you know, just responsive, you know, and just because each time I felt like, you know, if I showed you how many, let me, I'm going to show you right here. Matter <laughs> of fact, since you're right here, this is, look how many unread messages I have. Do you see that at the bottom, the text? Oh, 629. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. this is in real time and and I didn't even realize it until mm. vacation. Like, oh my God, there are all these messages. Yeah. And I want to respond to each person. And I, I felt each time that I would be like, I want to give them proper attention. Yeah. So I'll I'll reply to them later, like later today. But then another two would come in. It's you just bet. like that's too much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's Usher Raymond confessions right now. Happening. Yeah. And, and it's amazing because if we don't pick these up, it's almost like not noticing that the half a cup of coffee turned into one, turned into two. Right. So these are signals when my unread messages move up another hundred. Right. I went from the six yeah. hundreds to the seven hundreds. That's like it moving up. Yeah. So that's a great clue. And then the other thing that you're speaking about is that almost depersonalization space in the sense that you want to connect to your friends, but like not now, if they could only, if they could see, oh my God. And so there's this way that you're not connecting, right? Or when you do get to connect, I bet you it's like a deep dive. It's like you just (laughs) make time for them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And if I had it, if if I had a healthier connection and I wouldn't have allowed this to kind of pile on me and depersonalize, you know, uh, for for the people that I have in my life now, so often they want to help, right? They yeah. want to be able to like for me to 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 be able to offload some of this or you know certain things that I want to accomplish, and they could be right there to support that if I yeah. just took a moment, yeah, you know. But of course, there's also this underlying feeling of people wanting things from me as well you that bet. I might not have the bandwidth for, and yeah. just like that all getting mixed up in a weird psychological gumbo. So a little bit of boundaries, right? Being clear, clear on, uh, clearly, concisely, and compassionately being able to voice boundaries. Uh, the other piece, you know, I think I use depersonalization in a little bit of a not not the right way. So depersonalization is more like when we kind of don't connect to someone, don't use their name, don't use their 
uh, like the person in bed nine, you aren't really depersonalizing with your friends. You're just kind of like distancing yourself from them. And you're doing that co to conserve energy too. You're also feeling like if I connected to them, the dam could break. Like if you had to tell them what was really happening, it would be like, oh, yeah. so you'd rather <laughs> connect to them when you had that space and time yeah. to do it. But in the process, you're isolating a little bit and distancing. Um, okay. Question number four, what else in your life needs to be healed? Uh, my son, my mm. oldest son, mm. you know, he moved out recently mm. and just that transition was not what we expected it to be. And expectation mm. is part of the issue, mm. but you know, um, that coming after, like it kind of bookended, you know, mm. my father passing away, mm. then going on this sprint to try to get this family oriented cookbook to the world. Yep. And then my son Mm. leaving the nest, wow! you know, um, right, you know, just like a month after the book comes out and, you know, I just wasn't prepared to process all that stuff. And now yeah. I've got my little boy at home. Ugh. Yeah. Take a nice deep breath. <sighs> this is so beautiful. There's so many people going through it, right? And you're feeling it, but this is what slowing down is. And then you just let it move through you. Hmm. I just want to say thank you because what I believe about us being emotional is that we trust ourselves enough. You trust yourself enough. You trust me enough. And you trust the listeners enough to show us what's close to your heart. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. So that piece of it is a big shift and a big change that you're going through. Yeah, and then I'd say question number five. If you spoke from the heart, what would you say? Everything is going to be okay. Mm. Um, you know, trust the process. Love myself, take care of myself. You know, um, pour into me, make myself a priority. Mm. Um, you know, of course, I carve out that time for myself to be strong for everyone else, mm. you know? And, um, you know, and, and another thing that's coming up is just to to talk with the people that love me, mm. you know? Um, talk with my son. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. What would you tell him? What would you tell him? That I love him and I'm proud of him. Mm. And I believe in him. And, you know, he gets to write his own story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm, I can feel myself now. Mm, thank you for that. Yeah. Mm. So the awareness <sighs> prescription. There was never a single patient that didn't know what was at the root of their stress, why something had happened. And what I believe is every interaction experience, relationship. I mean, I've known you for how long, right? An hour. And what I'd say is like, that felt like a sacred exchange to me that it doesn't, as human beings, we don't need to know each other for a long time to dip in and choose to be real, to trust ourselves and share what matters. I did this every day with my patients, right? Uh, I think in healthcare, giving people a physical prescription and telling them to take three pills twice a day and see you in two weeks is a big miss on the healing. Yeah. And I just want to say thank you for being willing to be vulnerable on your own show and <laughs> being willing to be the one yeah. to go through the questions that can get to the root of your stress. And then now just check in, check in with your shoulders. It might be a little Yeah, up. I feel lighter. Oh, good. I feel lighter right now. Good. I'm so grateful. I did not know this was going to happen today, <laughs> but yeah, I'm so grateful. And I knew I, you know, we had a couple little synchronicities that mm -hmm. we talked about before the show, but I, I knew that today was for me, mm. you know, and yeah, I didn't know what form this was going to come in, mm. but yeah, I'm so, so grateful. Yeah. Thank you. You are so welcome. Thank you. you are so welcome. You know, this is, we all have this ability, you know, and 
unfortunately, because we're so, and this is one of the things you talk about in the book as well, to the, the life that we are all living today, there isn't any time for, it's not about disconnection, it's more like reconnection, like connecting to what is real, what is eternal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned earlier that rustling of the leaves mm -hmm. and that being an indicator, it being a, a very important data and us evolving as a part of nature, yeah. right? And now we have this distinction, us and nature, which is very strange <laughs> because we are, we cannot not be a part of it. We breathe out, the trees breathe in. The trees yeah. breathe out, we breathe in. And like. now today we have this, and if you think of the span of time and how, you know, the jumps that we've made, you know, 10,000 years of, you know, um, agriculture and being able to create industry eventually, like that was just a, a, a spot, like that was a like a 200 year period after just kind of figuring things out. And yeah. prior to that, thousands of years of hunter gatherer yep. and just a few decades of even having computers. Mm. And suddenly we are at artificial intelligence, like yep. these jumps. And I'm saying all this to say that part of the part of the new world, the new terrain that we're trying to navigate is endless access to us and endless mm. access to data. Yep. But not 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 quote natural data, you know those inputs we evolved with. Yeah. But there's so much to consume, so much yeah. digital data yeah. that we find ourselves, you know, um, spending our time in. And yeah. I'm not going to say wasting our time per se, but spending our time in, and people having 24 seven access to us. When there was a time, if you used to just go somewhere, you just go, you yeah. just be gone. I'll see you when I get back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and today we have an entirely different terrain that our biology, there's a mismatch yeah. that we're trying to adjust for. And so I want to talk a little bit about that because I don't, I know that most of us do not realize how much we are pulled. And I'm not using this word lightly. Okay. Mm -hmm. This isn't like a conspiracy, but we are pulled into this matrix. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Well, it's seductive. I mean, it's here's the thing. I think we're going to have something called digital health pretty soon, right? Where we're going to be talking about that, just like we talk about our physical health and our mental, emotional, social, spiritual health. There's digital health too, mm -hmm. because it's now how we communicate. It's now a whole another realm. Here's the thing, just like money, just like I think technology is the same as money. People make things good and bad, but I think these are just tools. And what matters is the consciousness of the user. No one demonizes Oprah for having the money she has because the consciousness with which she uses it helps humanity. She has nice things. She uses it to help the causes she cares about. And she is generous with others, right? In many, many aspects. I, I don't think money is the problem. I don't think technology is the problem. But I do think the consciousness of us as users is what we need to be focusing on. So when I know my highest values, when I know that love, integrity, service, beauty, and play are some of my highest values. Then when I'm making decisions, I can make them almost like with a grid of, does this pass my values filter test? Mm -hmm. So an opportunity, I come up with it or you come up with it, or there's one presented on, you know, I'm scrolling through social media and there's some opportunity. We have to have better ways of decision-making because otherwise we get lost. It's almost like we are driftwood floating in the ocean versus being sailboats with a rudder hmm. that are influenced by the wind, but we're charting our own course. And that's really what I wish for us. I wish for us that in this world, you know, we're the ones who have put our brains together to co-create this crazy fast world. And it would never have gotten done if we didn't all collectively buy into it. I think that we do this and we shut down the body signals, my heart's passion, my soul, my spirit. You know, I say those things are fine. I'm just going to get up and go to work and make my money for the day. I can only do that if I think, if I care more about the, what the collective thinks success is. Yeah. And I want to live up to that. Mm -hmm. 
if I care about who I am, if I develop who I am and what makes me happy, and I have the autonomy within this collective to have me, we, and world, we would all be aligned with what we love. It's almost like Burning Man. It's like people show up at Burning Man with their gift, whatever that is, right? Just today, I was making my wife's coffee and she was like, do people still go to Burning Man? Like yep. literally today, she said that, <laughs> you know? So and, as you were saying- I went in 2012. In 2012, I went. I was about to give a talk, a TEDx talk on the community cure. And there was a part of me that felt a little bit like a fraud. How am I the one giving the community cure talk when I haven't experienced what many people, you know, what, what was that? I guess 12, 12 years ago, describe as one of the most powerful communities. And so I went there and what I really got was that if each one of us shows up with our gifts and the spirit of generosity, we'll have what we need. But if we're all trying to be make the most money, attain the highest number of likes, whatever it is that society tells us is most important. We're contorting ourselves into a pretzel mm. to try and become something so others will like us. Then when they like us, it's like a double-edged sword because I'm like, hey, listen, you don't really know me. This isn't me. This is the contorted version of me. And so how do we help people now, you're doing it through through this amazing podcast and your books, but it's like, how do we become a world that individually knows who we are, that collectively is honoring each other's boundaries, able to speak and voice what we need, connects and is open to our differences and celebrates those as what makes us unique and beautiful? Yeah. Boy, a skyline would be so boring if it was the same you know, same shape and size. Screen saver, skyline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I think that's really how I think about it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think this whole digital digital space, we we have to raise our children now with time away and a little bit of what we had growing up, which was the like playing outside with like no agenda, hmm. you know, like yeah. feeling things. It, they're so afraid of conflict. You know, even on my own team, they would rather send me a video of themselves that they can like control before they hit send than do a real FaceTime or mm. make a real phone call. Yeah. The, the real time nature is the danger now. It feels scary. It feels too unknown. Right. But then what are we doing to human interaction? Yeah, it, we're, we're, we're taking certain ingredients out. And the yeah. recipe is completely different. It you is. Know? Part of the reason I transitioned to this was like our access to so much information and the yeah. ability to also, again, use it ethically and to support and to be of service and all the things is that I have that access through it all to keep working, right? Yeah. And not, again, it's it can be a distraction from paying attention to the thing that is festering underneath the surface. And so- you know, you taking me through these exercises and I encourage again, all of us, make sure to get a copy of the book yeah. and to be able to utilize this knowledge, ask ourselves, do the internal investigation for ourselves because what could potentially happen, let me just give a different scenario. Sure. Um, I'm dealing with this pain and I don't have any clue about it. Like I was myself, you know, 25 years ago and experiencing that I might go to see my physician like, hey, you know, I'm just in a lot of pain, can't really move my head very yep. well. I've got these knots in my shoulder. Yep. Here's an inset. Yeah. Right? Right. And no so- No investigation into yeah. what is the root cause. And now that might give me some relief, but my body is giving me important feedback. And it could yeah. be through a, an acute thing. You could be a little trauma, but- Yeah, but what we know is your headache is not an Advil deficiency, right? Boom. That's- it. it it will temporarily get you through. And so there's these two tracks. I'm not against medication. I take thyroid medication each morning. Um, but when you're taking like a pain medication, that's the acute relief. And then underneath, we're trying to help you figure out what is going to solve and resolve this. And it's the same way with burnout. When people are burned out, let's say they go to EAP, Employee Assistance Program. Employee Assistance Program sends them to me. Now, I've got a few tools that I could give them. One is I have the power of the pen to write them for paid time off. 
The second thing is I can give them some cocktail of medications, an antidepressant, anti-anxiety, or insomnia medication, depending on the presenting symptoms. These are really good because if someone's about to fall over the cliff, I get to pull them back, stop that train from just, you know, going right over. And I get to help knock their physiology back into rhythm, getting them to sleep again. Here's the problem. 10 days, two months later, I send them back in the ring for round two without any idea of what happened. So the acute phase is this phase. And then there's the, the parallel phase, which is why I wrote Powered by Me, which is, all right, if you want to figure out on your time off what the underlying causes are and how to turn those around, that's going to be important. And what I found when I asked all my patients the awareness prescription, those five questions, and by the way, I'll, I'm happy to give that to your group as well if they want the awareness uh, prescription and a place that they can just fill all those in. Um, what I found was that 85% of my patients would describe what's at the root of their stress as being the inability to communicate with themselves or the people they love or lead. Now, what you described in your awareness prescription, right, was, wow, I might not be processing my own pain. That's you communicating with yourself and with those you love and lead, your son, your community, your the, the grief with your father, feeling that responsibility. So when I realized that communication was such a big piece of the root of people's stress, uh, that's when I decided I better put together something really comprehensive because how people get to burnout is as unique as their fingerprint, yeah. right? They have such a unique uh, set of circumstances that bring them there. And so when you when you look at the net gain, net drain of physical, mental, emotional, social, spiritual, you can capture everybody and they'll say something like, oh, it's physical and emotional. Oh, 10 years ago, it was definitely spiritual when I didn't know, have meaning in my career and whatever. Oh, but now it's, so now it's kind of a, a way that simplifies it and demystifies it for them. I love this. Well, we are nearing the conclusion of this conversation, which we're going to have many more in the future. You bet. Um, and if you could give us just little micro bits, because of course, like we started to unpack the physical side. Sure. And you mentioned the nutrition inputs, the sleep sure. inputs. So let's just give a little glimpse into these other sure. categories. Let me just run run down uh, what I what I would say here. So physical energy. I want you to get a, a pulse check of where you are in this moment. It may change tomorrow, right? But you want to know, oh gosh, where am I? Where am I having a net gain, net drain physically? Am I nourishing myself with uh, physical, you know, whole foods at whatever intervals feel right to you? I know some people are doing fasting, et cetera, but at the right intervals for me. Next question. Am I sleeping seven to nine hours of quality sleep per night? Now, some people can do less than that, but I have to say there's too many people who think they can do less than that. Um, next, your energy. Do I have consistent energy throughout the day or do I hit those three o'clock energy dips, right? Are there, are there times after lunch or whatever where I'm not feeling so great? Next is, um, do I have a joyful way to move my, in my body multiple times per week? And it's about how satisfied are you with each of these categories. I'm not telling you you have to follow what I think is right. I want you to ask yourself how satisfied you are with that. And anything that's less than a 10, underneath it, just write in each of these categories, what would make it a 10? You've got your whole plan right there physically. Let's move to mentally. Mentally is really about there's different ways that we think. So let's say I was supposed to show up for this podcast and there was no email, no text, and 15 minutes had gone by and I didn't show up. What's the first thought that would come to you? Is she crazy? <laughs> She's missing that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, probably that, you know, you're just running late. Something must have happened that's slowing you down. Okay. Or you you might have think, she is so rude. Like, oh, she <laughs> should have at least contacted us. I know we sent the number. Or you could have thought, uh, wow, I might have gotten the day wrong. Right? And you might have thought about your, okay. Okay. There's different ways when something happens that's unexpected, 
there's different ways our brain processes it, personalizes it, makes it about me. It might be my fault. Projects it, makes it about you. It's your fault. You were rude. Or makes it bigger than me. Oh, it's LA traffic. Oh, maybe her flight didn't come, right? Whatever it is. So that's generalizing. In the mental category, you want to take a moment to gather what are the top three thoughts that run on repeat in your mind? Kind of the ones that run while you're driving down the highway or in the shower or when you wake up first thing in the morning. Write down those three thoughts that are running in the back on repeat. And then underneath it, pay attention to your body, whether it's constricted, tight, heavy, that's net drain, or open, relaxed, and light. That's net gain. You know how you said at the end of the awareness prescription, I feel a lightness, net gain of energy, but you're doing a body check-in, not just a head check-in, not just a heart check-in, but a body check-in. So when you write down these three common thoughts that are on repeat in your head, check in with your body, net gain or net drain on those three thoughts on repeat. Okay. Emotional energy, pretty easy one to know whether you have a net gain or a net drain. You, I'd ask you, where in your life are you avoiding challenging emotions or conflict? Home, work, social, right? Where, where in your life are you avoiding those conversations? You can feel it already. It's like, oh, that drain. <laughs> and the flip of that, what areas of your life bring you joy and uh, peace? So you check those and, and then check in with your body. And overall, do you have a net gain or a net drain? Then we move into social. Social's easy. Write down the top five individuals or groups of people you spend the most time with. I'm looking at the team here. The most time with uh, and online or in person. And as you're writing that in underneath, pay attention to your body checking in because your mind might say, oh, well, you know, I can sleep when I'm dead. I don't need to sleep right now, but your body will feel heavy. So you, that's why those have to be in alignment, your body with your mind. So once you write down the five group people or groups of people you spend the most time with, then put net gain, net drain, and then look across them and then give yourself in a social level. What are you overall? And then you move into spiritual, spiritual people said to me, why did you write a spiritual energy section in a book that's, quote, a business book. And I said, because I think it's the most important section that drives everything else. What I mean by spiritual energy is, do you know what your highest values are? Can you name them? And do you make, are you able to make quick and effective decisions using your highest values? So that's about alignment. And this leads into self-trust, which is how do you navigate the unknown? We're, we're in a world moving faster and faster by the minute. How do you assess your own self-trust? So the part of the uh, bur awareness prescription for burnout that I'll give you uh, in the notes is essentially asking you, in what arenas do you take risks physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, spiritually, financially, entrepreneurially, what is it? So for me, what I'd say is mentally, emotionally, socially, spiritually, and financially, entrepreneurially, yes. But up until recently, definitely not romantically, and definitely not as, like, I'm not the one jumping out of a skydiving, out of an airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, like, people go bungee jumping, and I'm like, I'll drive you there, I'll take the photos, like, you're doing the bungee jumping. So right away, when you hear where I take risks and where I don't, you automatically know where I trust myself and where I don't. So when people answer that, that'll help them in the spiritual energy, because that's where you're playing it safe and you're contracting versus taking the risks. Like even today, you taking the risk to just answer so open heartedly, right? That's, that's an emotional risk. And so uh, people want to understand that part of the spiritual energy. And then it's about how do you feel valued and appreciated both at home and at work? And lastly, you know, do you feel connected to your life where you put your energy that it has a bigger impact and meaning and purpose in the world beyond you? Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Uh, the risk often determines the capacity for reward. Mm -hmm. You know, and so this has been so 
Awesome. There's so much more. Yeah. And can you let everybody know where they can pick up a copy of the book? And also you mentioned a couple of URLs sure. to share some resources sure. as well. All right. So intuitiveintelligenceinc.com is where you can find my world. Um, and the book is everywhere. So anywhere you buy books, so Barnes and Noble and anywhere online. Um, and the URLs that I think will be the most useful for today are the Awareness Prescription for Burnout, which is intuitiveintelligenceinc.com. So inc.com forward slash burnout hyphen rx. So that's going to give them that overall pulse check. It also has six videos of me walking them through each piece. The second URL that I think is really important is the awareness prescription. And that will be intuitiveintelligenceinc.com forward slash awareness. And those are the five questions to ask when you're facing a dilemma to help you get underneath what's happening and really kind of get to the root. So take care of it acutely and then get to the root in parallel for what's happening. Awesome. So generous. Thank mm. you. I am so grateful for this conversation today. You're amazing. Mm. Thank you. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. I'm a scientist. What scientists do is that we are interested in looking at the origins of things. So where does fat come from? Like fat doesn't just automatically come up when we're adult and we want to actually lose some weight. Turns out what's amazing is that fat forms when we're in the womb.